And there's Joey Carr coming. Welcome, everyone, and blessed, great Monday for each of you. We're so blessed to have a special guest here from Austria, and we welcome um, Elizabeth. We get your name right, Savage Wolf. Is that correct? Fantastic. Well done. Yes. And also, we have Prince Grandmaster Nicholas Papa Nicolau here, who is the worldwide leader of the Knights of Malta, the Ecumenical Order. And welcome, uh, Dr. Nicholas, who's also a graduate of our school. So we have a lot of educators here today. It's going to be a blessed time. And welcome those online and those that will be tuning in or watching later because many aren't able to be here during a weekday because of their day jobs. So welcome, uh, Dr. Nicholas. You want to introduce our special guest? Thank you, George. First of all, thank you for organizing this. Uh, Elizabeth is a fellow knight, as, as you are, and uh, Nancy here, and Nancy Daniel, and myself, and uh, we feel that uh, her story must be heard uh, internationally because it, it really is an extraordinary story. Um, it speaks to what has happened with limitations on freedom of spe speech in Europe uh, and how dangerous that is. Uh, where the rights to freedom of speech are basically being um, pushed aside by the crowd that uh, has invented a right uh, of, quote, not to be offended, uh, unquote, which has no constitutional basis in, in any of the constitutions of the European nations, as it also has no basis in our constitution here in America. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is uh, the daughter of an Austrian diplomat, uh, so she was raised in many countries. Uh, she happened to be in Iran when uh, the uh, Ayatollahs took over, and so she can speak from as a personal eyewitness uh, to what happened to the rights of Christians there. She also spent time growing up in uh, Baghdad um, and has really has you know traveled all over the place. Uh, um, her husband is a uh, colonel in the uh, Austrian army, a surgeon, uh, who also headed up the uh, Allied Hospital uh, in uh, theaters of war, such as in Kosovo and in uh, Mali. And so Elizabeth, in many ways, has been sort of on the forefront of uh, uh, the, the fight, the confrontation that we see in our world today between uh, uh, the forces of Christianity, the forces of uh, personal liberty, uh, the constitutional rights that we believe are the foundation of Western culture, and yet we live in an environment today where even here in America, those, those constitutional rights are not only being challenged, they're actually uh, being actively curtailed. So uh, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to share with us uh, a little bit of her story uh, and what happened in, both with her upbringing, but also more recently her experiences in Austria, which we all assume is a, a Western European nation with a liberal, uh, you know, uh, human rights uh, tradition. And yet uh, she can speak from personal experience to, to what happened to her. So Elizabeth, uh, what I'm envisioning here, and, and I think George agrees is, you know, you, you take it away, you know, start to tell us your story, but I hope you don't mind if we interrupt in. with questions, yeah, mm -hmm. to, you know, further explain or expose, you know, some of the experiences mm -hmm. that, that you have. I want to say to our audience that uh, I have a personal admiration for Elizabeth because she is a fighter and she is a fighter for these values which we hold dear and which many in the political leadership in Europe and now more recently in America tend to forget. And they tend to forget them to our detriment, to the detriment of the people. So take it away, Elizabeth. And as I say, if we interrupt you, either George or I, I hope you won't mind. Absolutely not. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for your wonderful introduction and to you, George, for uh, making this possible. And let me also add that it's always been a dream of mine uh, to come to uh, both North Carolina and South Carolina. And I had been praying about this for a long time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy We're to so be here. We're so glad you're here. Thank, thank you, you for thank sharing you. your time it's, with us. It's just, uh, uh, you know, thank you for making this uh, happen. Um, 
my life, you know, people have said to me, uh, when there is a crisis, you can be sure that Elizabeth is there. <laughs> when history is made, you can be sure Elizabeth is there. And and so it was. So, you know, I, I told you before I was I was born in Switzerland because my father was posted there. Uh, I spent two and a half years in New York, went to kindergarten. I mentioned that because it was the first time I learned English. Um, I then lost it com completely when my father was uh, posted uh, to the Austrian embassy in Tehran in 1977, when Tehran was, Iran was still uh, run by the Shah, autocratic, yes, we all know that. Yes, there were uh, political prisoners. Yes, it was not a free liberal Western country in any sense of the word, but... Uh, it was fairly secular, and you could have a great life there. And for in, from 1977 until the Iranian Revolution, we did have a great life there. Uh, we had, uh, I went to school, I went to German school. Uh, we had uh, mass, I would say, every other week because we had an, uh, a Catholic priest who, uh, an Aust uh, a Bavarian Catholic priest who flew in to, into Iran and uh, held mass with us. And it was always a very special moment uh, to gather in an Islamic country uh, to, to uh, praise the Lord and, and uh, have uh, celebrate mass together in a community. And as a young girl, I was seven years, six, seven years old, first and second grade. Um, I, I was already pretty aware of my surroundings. And I started to, to get a sense of increased uh, demonstrations in the streets and uh, a, a general discomfort that I that I felt and so in late 1978 my mother my sister and I were expelled from Iran uh, by the uh, Iranian authorities because it had gotten too dangerous for us to remain so my mother and my father were forcibly separated and we returned to Austria only to be we were only able to return uh, to Iran to my dad uh, for school holidays. So this was a very challenging time for us as a family, and it must have been hell. And I know it was hell for my mother uh, to go through. So when we returned uh, during school vacations, it was so obvious the difference uh, to see. You know, it's a, a theocr it, it turned into a theocratic uh, society. Women uh, had to cover from head to toe. Which we of course didn't do, but it was it was already it was very difficult to navigate around Tehran. We were not allowed to live, leave the city anymore, and uh, there were food shortages. And when uh, the American embassy was taken over, and the hostages the American hostages were taken, my mother took it upon herself uh, to to uh, prepare food for the three hostages uh, held at the um, Iranian foreign ministry. So Bruce Langan was one of the diplomats and I can really recommend his, his book. He has since passed away. I, I really would have liked to, you know, gotten together with him before his death. Um, so, and of course my mother had to uh, tell us kids, my, my sister and me, uh, you know, this food is not for you. This food is for the hostages in the in the Amer um, in the foreign ministry. So that must have been really hard having to tell her own uh, daughters, you can't have all that food that's being prepared. Mm -hmm. So um, I experienced firsthand what happens when Islam takes over a formerly secular country. And I can as a child, I knew that it was to the detriment of the country and to society. And uh, I, I was scared. I was really scared at the time. Little did I know that this would make a huge impact on me uh, later in life. Um, I'm going to leave out quite a bit of that because I think you should, you should, you can actually read it in my book, which will I then, which which I will then uh, show you later. Um, in 19, we returned to Austria. My dad was finally uh, transferred back to Austria in 1980. And in 1982, Christmas time, uh, I spent uh, Christmas and New Year's in Baghdad during the war. And uh, there, what, what, what I remember specifically about that time was Christmas mass. 
uh, in the middle of a war zone in Baghdad. And uh, just the beauty of mass uh, with fellow Christians in, in, a, in a challenging situation, but there was so, there were so many happy faces and beautiful music. It was a different way to celebrate mass back then, but uh, we were made uh, welcome, which is, we were, we felt very welcome. And that's one of the beautiful aspects about uh, fellowshipping in Christianity, that you're always considered a uh, family. And I, I, I remember that I was 11 years old. It was a very special moment. So uh, fast forward 1983, we moved to Chicago, which is uh, the reason for my English. I mentioned Chicago, four years of Chicago, uh, because it was in eighth grade. I attended a Sacred Heart School in Chicago, Sheridan Road. Um, I had to study, I was forced, actually, I have to word it this way. I was forced to study the constitution, which at the time, of course, when you're 12 years old, you know, you're in a special time of your life. And I said to myself, why do I have to study the U S constitution? I should be studying my own constitution. Well, that was not to be. So I, uh, I wanted to graduate eighth grade. So I studied really, really hard. We had an excellent teacher. Uh, who prepared us well and you know i marveled at the time that uh this constitution is so easy to understand that even an eighth grader can can understand it it's short it's concise it's to the point and only later on in life would i realize that this is really the greatest political document ever written yes absolutely. it really it really mm -hmm. is yes it is it is again short concise an eighth grader can understand it um, and and the Bill of Rights, and again, little did I know that the Bill of Rights would be so important later on in my life, uh, and that I look to America every time I'm in Europe, and I cannot speak out as freely as I can right here, um, to the First Amendment. Yeah. Uh, and, and just a little parenthesis, if I may, uh, for the benefit of our audience. So we have the Constitution, and then we have the amendments to the Constitution, which uh, total 28, but the first 10 of those amendments are the so-called Bill of Rights. And of course, the First Amendment, which is kind of famous uh, for all of us and extremely important in our way of life, is the one that protects freedom of speech, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and freedom to address our grievances against the government. Those and are the five assemble too. Uh, the freedom of assembly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those are the five fundamental uh, rights that are given under the, the Bill of Rights and specifically the First Amendment. So I'm just saying this mm -hmm. for the Very important. of, of yes. our audience. Thank you. And, and Thank you. that was adopted in 1791. Well, the main constitu the constitution was adopted in 1787. But the, the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments, were adopted uh, four years later. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, uh, it's everybody, I believe everybody on this planet should uh, should be living under the first, you know, the, the, the Bill of Rights. Or uh, we, you know, if the, if the entire planet, uh, people on this earth, believed and lived according to the Ten Commandments, this world would be a better place. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a Christian, but as, as long as you lived your life according to the Ten Commandments, I think we would all be better off. Uh, it's, this is my personal belief. So, uh, so 1987, so four years of my life spent in Chicago, and then we once again returned to Austria. I graduated uh, high school in Austria in 1989 and then came 1990 when once again Elizabeth was a part of history because I not only became a ski instructor but of course there's very little skiing in the summer so I was tasked and asked uh, to go to the Austrian embassy in Kuwait uh, yes exactly uh, so I arrived in, in Kuwait in May of 1990 I was 19 years old at the time. And uh, I was in the visa section, stamping visas at the time. Of course, there were no, there were still stamps. It was all very low technical standard. Um, but that's what I did for three months until 
uh, August 2nd, 1990, when I woke up in a war zone with helicopters flying above us and tanks rolling in the streets. Mm. And uh, yeah, I couldn't leave the country. Uh, none of us could. And those who tried, many of them uh, perished in the desert. And that was the invasion of Iraq. That was of Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein. Who tried to Correct. conquer Kuwait and make it his own. Correct. But I also have to add, uh, in this case, aided by a very weak uh, ambassador to the uh, American ambassador to Iraq, April Glaspie, who basically a few days before uh, the invasion gave an a tacit agreement, a tacit go ahead saying to Saddam Hussein, we, we basically have no beef in your fight uh, with uh, Kuwait. And uh, Saddam Hussein then interpreted uh, these words as the go ahead for the invasion. Um, I didn't really concern myself with the reason for the invasion. I just figured I needed to stay safe and try to, to make it back home. Uh, immediately, of course, what do you do in a, uh, the invading army? What does it do right away? It knocks out all the communication. So we, I wasn't able to communicate uh, with my parents. Um, only now that I am a mother can I understand what my mother must have gone through. Uh, not not being able to uh, talk with me, not knowing whether I was alive, whether I was being raped, uh, whether I had enough food just to sustain myself. Uh, she need she need not have worried because I was in good company. We were in the embassy building. The Iraqis did accept uh, and respect uh, diplomatic uh, immunity and also diplomatic, um, you know, when the embassy, the embassy is considered Austrian territory, so, so they actually left uh, the uh, embassy compounds alone for the time being. So long story short, because this is also detailed in my book, uh, a convoy of Austrian citizens made uh, their way across the desert. If you have your geography in mind, it's about 1,450 kilo kilometers. I don't know what it is in miles. About 30 miles. Uh, okay. About 14 or 15. 1,500. Oh, 1,500. 1,500. Kilometers. So that's about 950 miles. Okay. Well, you you figure that out and uh, doing that in the, in the, in the summer heat, uh, in a flat desert, not aware or uh, about, are the Americans going to attack? Are they going to take back? We didn't know at the time, there was no intelligence. And it's a flat desert. It's not one of these, uh, you know, Moroccan deserts or um, Saudi deserts where you have the beautiful sand dunes. It is just a, a flat, rocky desert. Where do you hide? How do you go to the bathroom? How do you do that? And uh, so we went all the way across uh, the Iraqi uh, territory with a short stop in Baghdad and then made our way to the uh, Turkish border, Turkish-Iraqi border, where a few of our fellow hostages were able to cross. I was not among them because I, I, I gave up my, my place uh, to a mother with her sick child. And I said, if I don't make it back home, my mother has another daughter. I was I I was wow. pretty certain that I you know there is a chance that I might not make it home. Well, because I'm sitting here with you, thank God, mm -hmm. I did make it home. Like I said, please do read it uh, in the book. But you know, I'd like to tell you that I I I should have been dead, you know, many times already. Mm -hmm. And there must be someone out there looking out for me and my work is not done yet. I still have a job to do, and I really think I feel fervently believe that my job in 1990 was to continue living and you know I would I would have to do more um, and that's what I what I did so anyway I returned in 1990 I'll fast forward um, I worked uh, with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in his cabinet I was his secretary uh, in the 1990s and in 1997 I once again returned to Kuwait uh, to work in at my old uh, workplace, stamping visas, and uh, this time, you know, uh, technology had caught up with uh, the Austrian authorities. We now had stickers. <laughs> ah, 
Uh, I didn't have to, I didn't have to, um, you know, it wasn't stamping anymore. It was stickers. So uh, I had a, I had a good time. I was in Kuwait for four years. I met my husband there and not only did meeting my husband change my life, but it would also change my life. Um, and that will actually lead to the story of 2009 when I had to face uh, a judge um, we had a, the embassy had employed a translator, an interpreter, a Jordanian man who, spec, uh, who, who studied in Germany, architecture in Germany and spoke perfect German. And he and I would talk a lot about uh, everything under the sun, including, of course, his religion. And one day my duty uh, included reading the local English language newspapers. And I started, I, I read something about Muhammad's child bride, Aisha, and uh, her quote unquote marriage to, to Muhammad. And I remember running over to his office to, uh, oh, I don't even remember his name. I totally blocked him out of my mind. Uh, Hussein, Hussein was his name. And I said, I said to Hussein, Hussein, is that true? Did did your prophet really marry a child? And his face, I remember it so 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 vividly. His face contorted, and he started. He he got this really angry face, and I was afraid of him. And I said, Hussein, what's the matter? And he said, Don't you ever talk like that again. And I said, Well, well, why? And he said. Uh, people are bad, but religion is good, and I'll leave it at that. Hmm. So he said that to me, and I, 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 I must have instinctively known not to push it any further. And uh, I suppose uh, the Lord told me, you know, just be quiet now. Your time will come later, and it sure did. Um, let me also add that, of course, four years uh, for four years, I had to experience. Ramadan, which is a challenge for non-Muslims, uh, but I, you know, I was a young girl or, or young woman at the time. Of course, I I still had my salami sandwich. Mm -hmm. I didn't care. I had all the water in the world. Um, uh, it wasn't meant to be disrespectful. It was what I did was I rebelled against these rules, which I think are stupid. And uh, they were rules. I, I didn't consider them a, a, a divine rule. They were just rules imposed on people for no real reason. So anyway, uh, I left Kuwait in 2000. I got married uh, to my husband in 2000. And uh, I moved on to Libya. I apparently hadn't gotten enough of Islam yet. <laughs> And uh, I moved to Libya while my husband finished his medical degree in Vienna and the flying time between uh, Vienna and Tripoli was only about an hour and a half. So my, my husband could actually travel back and forth to visit me. Uh, without going into much detail, uh, which again, you can read in the book, uh, the, that one year in Libya was probably the hardest life, year in my entire life. I don't, I think it even topped all those years when I fought my uh, my case uh, in in the courts, um, it was Libya was a really hard to a hard place. You needed a lot of faith and a lot of uh, strength in in to 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 survive Libya. Again, I will uh, detail I detail that in in the book. So two thousand one. Oh, by the way, uh, nine eleven. Guess where I was? Libya. I was not in New York. I was in Libya. And my Libyan landlord stormed into my apartment on 9-11 and started screaming, the Jews did it, the Jews did it. And I said to him, I don't really believe so. Um, it was certainly not the Jews. And I asked him to, I don't know why he even was, why he was even able to enter my apartment. And I asked him to please leave and uh, not come back. So I traveled that day and uh, traveled back home that day, which is, was a strange feeling on 9-11 to travel back, to travel back home. 
So anyway, um, I had my 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 beautiful daughter in 2004. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's fast forward to got my 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 university degree. Um, and fast forward to 2008. When I was asked by a political party in Austria, uh, the only party that has the word freedom in its name, which is the Austrian Freedom Party. And mind you, I'm not a member of any political party. I would have done the same thing for any, for the socialists or the Greens or whoever, okay? This was just because the only uh, political party that would offer me a way to speak and explain Islam was uh, the Freedom Party. So I had, uh, I had educated myself uh, on Islam. I started... Uh, reading books uh, about Islam, I started uh, what I experienced in in all this the, these Islamic countries started to make sense. I started to understand why Hussein was so angry with me uh, and told me not to speak uh, about Aisha's age when she was forced to marry a fifty six year old man. And all of a sudden, I be again became very frightened uh, because I saw a lot of. There was a great influx of Muslims into Austria, especially because of the Bosnian War. Austria was very generous in uh, offering these people refuge in Austria. And again, I have to say to the detriment of the country, um, and I felt that I needed to speak out that uh, this ideology is not compatible with, uh, with either the constitution or Western civilization, Western liberal democracy, and having studied the the Quran and uh, the the Sunnah, the words and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, I came to the conclusion that we are indeed in trouble as a society. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I put together a PowerPoint presentation uh, lasting about twelve hours, so three days, four hours each, fully sourced. Um, and uh, off I went. Uh, a lot of people were interested. They were free. These seminars were free of charge to the Austrian people. And because these seminars became so successful, uh, they also came under the scrutiny of the hostile media. So unbeknownst to me, the seminar was infiltrated by a young leftist uh, journalist who surreptitiously recorded uh, the seminar. And then the transcript uh, was sent to the prosecutor, the public prosecutor, who then pressed charges initially for hate speech. Um, a year passed, and then um, I faced the judge, who was a woman. A little, and, a little parenthesis, if I may. Yes. So the, the proximate cause for the charges at the time, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was that you had said that... Um, uh, talking about Mohammed, who married Aisha when she was six, and then by his own admission, quote unquote, consummated the marriage when she was nine. And uh, is it is it correct that what you said is that if this happened today, he would be subject to criminal charges? I, am I right on that? No, no, oh. because I knew I would I would get in trouble for that. There had been a precedent, a legal precedent already. So that's not how I worded it. Uh -huh. But let me just back up a little bit. Remember, these were 12 hours, and the entire 12 hours were part of the trial. Oh. And the judge realized, uh, after playing the tapes, that this was in no way hate speech. But she needed to, she needed to convict me. So she drummed up, during the proceedings, drummed up another charge, which was denigration of religious teachings of a legally recognized religion in Austria. Uh, because uh, Christianity, well, Catholicism and other denominations are legally recognized in Austria. This goes back all the way to Joseph II, uh, Emperor Joseph II in uh, the 18th century, if I remember correctly. Excuse me. And so um, Islam is also legally recognized religion in Austria because the Emperor Francis Joseph um, in uh, Austria invaded Bosnia before the first uh, World War One, and in order to incorporate the Bosnian part of the army into the Austrian Austro-Hungarian army, 
there was a need to to sort of extend an olive branch to the Muslim soldiers. So uh, Islam became one of the, I'm reluctant to say it, but one of, of a legally recognized official religion. Okay, somewhat like that. So that got me into trouble. So the judge then uh, zeroed in on this one uh, sentence that I had uttered, which was a rhetorical question. Because of the legal precedent that somebody before me had said, Muhammad was a pedophile, that was a big, tr that was really a problem. She, she should have known better. Uh, I disagree with the ruling, but she should have, this lady should have known better. So because of the legal precedent, I said to my uh, students, to my listeners, we have to find a word to describe the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad. And how does one describe the behavior of uh, Muhammad in marrying a six-year-old and consummating the marriage? Uh, the, yes, the marriage when she was nine. What do we call it if not pedophilia? Mm -hmm. Now the judge purposely, on purpose, misunderstood me. I didn't say Muhammad was a pedophile. Right. But I said, what do we call this behavior if we aren't allowed to call it pedophilia? Mm -hmm. So her argument, her reasoning when she, when the judgment came down was, we can't call him a pedophile because he, he might have married her when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine, but she stayed with him until his death, which was when she was 18. So it's not pedophilia. Golly. And that was a woman, by the way, an embarrassment to all women out there. Really? So um, I was devastated, of course, uh, but appealed the case in uh, a few days before Christmas in 2011. The appeal was uh, rejected uh, for uh, and the judges said the appeal is rejected because you're while it may be true that he the the, the court actually said it's true what 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 happened as if they know how do they know it's a historical fact but they accepted that Mo, uh, Muhammad married him when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine as a historical fact now while that fact it might be historically true what you said is an excess of opinion Wrap your heads around that. Wow. An excess of opinion. So I lost the appeal. And I then uh, uh, went to the Austrian Supreme Court. I fought the char fought, I fought the, um, the verdict there. Of course, I lost all the way to the Supreme Court. But the loss at the Supreme Court opened the door to taking the case to before the European Court of Human Rights, which is a supranational court. Uh, of the Council of Europe. It's not a European Union court. The problem is that the Council of Europe includes freedom-loving nations like uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan. And uh, if you're unlucky, you'll get a judge from Azerbaijan and we all know where, where this would lead. So uh, I waited for many, many years uh, from 2012 until 2016. Uh, 17 for the case to be heard it was accepted the case was accepted that took a few years to to uh, accomplish that was already a big success my lawyer was quite hopeful that i would actually uh, win because the european court has traditionally been very friendly and pro uh freedom of speech well uh let me tell you a few uh days before my mother passed away in October 2018, uh, I received uh, notice that no, I lost again at the European Court of Human Rights with uh, the reasoning by the judges given that my right to free speech weighs less than a Muslim's right not to be offended. Terrible. Just wrap your hands around it. It is, it is just unbelievable. And the, the, the tragedy here is that this ruling has already caused at least two 
uh, other people, one in Algeria, I, I don't recall where the other one was, to, to be convicted on this, this uh, you know. With the same principle. With, yes. With the legal principle. With this, thank you. With the same legal principle, um, mm -hmm. because I lost at the uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. So this is this is very tragic uh, for me personally. Very, very, very tragic. Um, it's taken uh, a lot of reflection and prayer for me to to uh, not to give up uh, because you know this was a ten year fight. It wasn't easy. And it must have been expensive too. It was extremely expensive, but I can <laughs> I can tell you uh, that I am very blessed to know great people here in the United States, and um, I would say about. 85 to 90 percent of uh, donations came from the, from the United States because I know that the American people are extremely generous and you understand better than anyone how important it is to have freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I was I, I was able to to pay for all of this. I always said, you guys, if, if you if you want me to fight this all the way, uh, you need to help me financially to fight this all the way because I lost my job as soon as the charges came in um, 2009. So I have not I've not had a job since. And uh, what I do is <laughs> I speak to people like you, and, and I need to tell you uh, what happens in Europe. Uh, Nicholas, you said in the beginning this is a supposedly liberal democracy with a constitution guaranteeing. Uh, people's rights, and I'm I'm very sorry to say that this is not the case. That we have a freedom of speech, but, and whenever you have a freedom of speech, but it's not freedom, because freedom is an absolute concept. Well, what we have is more than that, because what we have essentially, and we we're beginning to see that in the United States now too, is an invented, a conjured up, supposed right not to be offended. None of the yes. constitutions, the American constitution or the European constitutions provide any clause that says that you have a right not to be offended. Mm -hmm. And yet what we see is that these forces that are either so apologetic or so far to the left have invented this right. And having invented it, they then superimpose it on the actual con factual constitutional rights that we have to freedom of speech and freedom of religion and so forth and so on. Now, the track record in America has not been, uh, has been stronger. It hasn't been as bad as, as it is in Europe, but we're seeing these same principles and this invented right of not to be offended being inserted here. And I must say that actually at the United Nations level, we see that too, because the, the UN Human Rights Commission, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, adopted resolution 16 stroke 19. 18. 18. 18, right. Yeah, which, which uh, 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 upholds this supposed right not to be offended. Now, we have to think about the ramifications of that. So uh, fortunately, the UN Assembly has not adopted that resolution of the UN Human Rights Commission. But I can say that the day that it was adopted by the Human Rights Commission, Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, wrote an effusive congratulatory uh, message to the chairman of the Human Rights Commission saying this is a historic day and blah, blah, blah. But when you actually think of the nuts and bolts of this, the ramifications of it, what it means mm -hmm. is that if, for example, you happen to be speaking with uh, a Muslim and you say that you believe in Jesus Christ and he finds that offensive, you are guilty of hate speech. I mean, it's turning everything upside down on its head. Mm -hmm. All logic, all precedent, and yet European societies have allowed this uh, to happen. Uh, possibly only with the exception of Great Britain, which decided to withdraw from uh, from uh, the, you know the European Union, but still they have their problems too because they've allowed so many cases on British sovereign soil to be adjudicated according to Sharia law instead of uh, British law. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, mm -hmm. pardon the interruption, but no, I, I, I want to highlight very... for our audience this invented right 
of not to be offended, which has no basis in fact and no constitutional basis. No, no, none, none at all. And we need to we need to stop it. And I, you know, I see that that your rights over over here in America are are being attacked too. And that's why I have made it my life mission to come to America as, as often as I as I can to remind you that yes, the situation here is is not as you want it to be, but it's up to you as Americans individually to do your part in upholding the constitution, in fighting for your rights. And remember one thing, yes, the situation is, is a difficult one. I get it, I see it, I, I, I'm, I'm sad for you. It breaks my heart to see what this country is actually going through, but we Europeans, we freedom loving Europeans, we look to you because you are the last bastion of freedom. You still have the constitution. Yes, it is under attack, but it is your duty because it is in your DNA to uphold the constitution and to defend freedom. Because remember one thing, after America, there's no place to go. Imagine if you Americans fall and America falls, where do refugees go? Where do you, where do, where do all these people go? There's no place on this planet where freedom loving people can emigrate to and make this great nation an even greater nation. This, you know, I, I can only really implore that you defend the constitution. Remember one thing, despite all that you are experiencing and seeing right now, because I know that the current administration is a very problematic one, a very, very troubling one, but you still have the freedom to defend freedom. Amen. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's so um, urgently timely that you are here with this message to help wake up Americans before it's too late, before we lose our freedoms and our constitutional rights that uh, our forefathers were inspired really by the spirit of the Lord to put that on paper and make that the law of the land. Um, the threat of Islam has been uh, insidious in infiltrating the United Nations, the European Union, uh, many nations, even playing into the hands of, of the CCP party. And we see now how China has enabled um, the uh, terrorist training capital of the world in Afghanistan by, um, you know, when the U.S. surrendered our uh, position in Afghanistan, they were quick to move in and the enemy joins forces with other enemies to help bring our country down. So our country is under threat as never before. And we certainly are at a historic crossroads where Americans, patriots, really followers of Jesus need to um, do all we can to educate, increase awareness on the local level and in, in school boards with perversion being taught to kindergartners and first graders and pornography being shown. Um, and the whole gender confusion um, um, conspiracy that is going on and calling evil good and good evil is rampant in our day. And so I pray that you will share this video, that you'll buy Elizabeth's book. Let's hold up your book, Elizabeth. I posted the link on Amazon to it. The truth is no defense. And we encourage you to get this book, buy a case of it, and share it with other people so that they become aware and become involved. And Elizabeth, thank you for being such a, a patriot of the nation of faith and being a freedom fighter to wake up others. And it's a, amazing testimonies that you have of how you were in those places just at those times, and you're still here today by God's grace. And it is truly a trumpet call to wake up freedom-loving people who stand for freedom of speech and not let that inalienable right be taken from us. So uh, thank you so much. Um, Nicholas, do you have anything else? Yes, there? A, we can a, a, for a, questions. A couple of things that I think are important. The first, uh, I speak for Elizabeth and I certainly speak for myself. None of us, and for you, George, none of us are here to poke fun or sarcasm at Islam. That's not what this no. is about. What this is about is preserving Western liberal values. So I have, for example, an abiding sympathy, and this mm -hmm. may strike you as being strange, an abiding sympathy 
for those young men who strap dynamite around themselves and they go and they blow themselves up and kill other innocent people, not because of the act of the terrorism that, that they have committed. I, I condemn that. But because if you go to the beginning and you think, why would a young man do this? It's because they're searching for God. What happens is they get, that they get twisted along their search for God by these imams, who, of course, the imams are never the ones to go out and blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. They'll send these innocent young men out, you know, twist their mind and then send them out. But it all begins with a search for God mm -hmm. that these young men have, and then they get twisted into becoming terrorists. terrorists. So I have, as a Christian, I have an abiding sympathy for them, and I just wish that the day will come when they will not be misled like that. And the second thing that I want to say is that, um, you know, many times here in America, when you say something about Islam, the standard answer that you get from a, a certain group of people is, well, we have freedom of religion in America, so therefore they can do whatever they want. If they want to marry a young underage girl, that's okay. If they want to kill a homosexual, it's okay, because that's what the Quran says, and so forth and so on. Well, that's not true. Because our constitution is very clear in granting freedom of religion, but there, there have been a series of cases, landmark cases, that have come out of the United States Supreme Court over the years, uh, the life of our republic here. The first landmark case being in 1878, and the case was called Reynolds versus the United States. Uh, what's the background? Reynolds was a high official in the Mormon church. And the Mormon church, as our audience probably knows, preaches bigamy and polygamy. So he was married. He was a higher official, official in the Mormon church. And he goes out on purpose and marries a second wife while he's married to his first. And of course, he gets sued by the local district attorney. In his defense, he pleads freedom of religion. And he says, uh, I'm a member of the Mormon church. This is my religion. The Constitution guarantees freedom of religion. I've done nothing wrong. What did the United States Supreme Court do? In effect, and I'm sl paraphrasing slightly, it said, your freedom of religion ends where our common laws begin. Yes. We have common laws against bigamy and polygamy. You violated them, so you are no longer covered by the protections of freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. And he went to jail. Mm -hmm. Our audience would be interested to know that the most recent case out of the United States Supreme Court reaffirming this, this legal principle is in 1987, fairly recent. And it is a case called Smith versus um, State of Oregon Unemployment Agency. What is the background there? Smith and his buddy were uh, constantly stoned on peyote. And they were working for a company and they were dismissed because they were constantly stoned. So when they were dismissed, they applied to, they lived in Oregon, they applied to the Oregon State Unemployment mm -hmm. Agency for benefits, and they were denied. The Oregon, and this is a liberal state, the Oregon State Unemployment Agency said, you're not entitled to, um, to compensation, to unemployment benefits, because you caused, with your behavior, you caused yourselves to be fired. So they, defending themselves, claimed in court well, we are members of the Native American church, which preaches the consumption of peyote. So freedom of religion, we did nothing wrong. And the case came to the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think the United States Supreme Court did? It said, oh, no, no. Your peyote is a prescribed substance in the state of Oregon. You're not entitled to consume it without a doctor's prescription. So you're not entitled to consume just because that's your religious belief. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you didn't have a prescription from your doctor prescribing this to you for some health reason means that you were out on your own. You're not protected by freedom of religion. You were correctly fired, and the state unemployment agency correctly denied you the rights that's to good. unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that we have, in American jurisprudence, a stream of cases that begin in 1878 and come all the way to 1980 seven, which have always affirmed the same principle, that there are, in fact, limitations to freedom of religion when the teachings and practices of a particular religion violate our common laws. Mm -hmm.
So that is an important thing That's a solid point. for our, our, our audience we to see keep in, in mind. In the United Kingdom, you know, the establishment of Sharia courts in many places in England, and America needs to prevent um, that from happening in this country. I think in Michigan, they're trying to advance uh, in Detroit, which is a heavily Muslim uh, population, uh, Sharia courts, but that needs to be prevented. And we, everyone in the world needs to know that the U.S. Constitution trumps and preempts any other type of religious law. And Islam really is, is not a religion, it's an ideology that the public needs to be educated about. And, and we do see, you know, there's such a complex uh, dichotomy going on around the world that so many that are in the great harvest that is now upon us are seeing visions of the man and they happen to be uh, Islamic backgrounds. And uh, we need to be prepared. This is certainly spiritual warfare at the roots and we need to stand up and followers of Jesus need to, to pray and intercede for the salvations of Muslims because Nicholas, you're right, your heart breaks when these young men who are searching for God will tie a, a suicide vest on them and blow themselves up. Well, that is uh, tragic and sad and we need to do you know, more to, education and more sharing. To, to end on a lighter note, uh, and this might give away my age, and that's okay, but one of my favorite singers and performers is Paul Anka. <laughs> and Paul Anka is, uh, his uh, uh, family ancestry is Lebanese, they're, they're what is known as Maronite Catholics. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at one of his concerts, I remember, uh, you know how they do a little talk in between, you know, songs. So he started to talk about his youth growing up in Canada. And he said that his dad was really on his case because he had not gone to confession. And so finally his dad pretty much took him by the ear and he said, I'm bringing you to the church, I'm bringing you to the Padre and you are going to do confession. And he was about 15 years old at the time. So Paul Anka goes in there and of course the, the Catholic priest is in the booth, he's sitting outside. And so the Catholic uh, priest in a very sonorous voice said to him, you know, we're now before the Lord and you are here to confess your sins. And so Paul Anka said, well, I listened to him and he gave me some of the rules. And then he said, uh, are you ready? And I said, yes. And, and the priest said, well, you may begin. And he said, I could not help myself. And I said, you go first. Oh, oh that's <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, you know, that's a, that's a sort of a principle that we should, we should keep in mind here too, you know, with, with um, the inroads that, uh, that Islam tries to, to, uh, to, to make in our lives. And we've got to be aware of the fact that a lot of the teachings and practices of Islam are antithetical to the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, sex with a minor girl, taking homosexuals and dropping them off from a high place, which is what the Quran mm -hmm. teaches. Um, the fact that uh, a wife in marriage is property because her husband has paid his wife's father money mm -hmm. To actually purchase her so mm -hmm. she's property she doesn't really have rights um uh killing the infidel all of these are are are, are, are precepts which are contrary to the u.s constitution really? so it's so true. they cannot stand in america and we must be ever vigilant about that and say no you know you can practice your religion so long as you don't violate any of our common laws which is the principle i repeat that the united states supreme court throughout the history of our republic has imposed mm -hmm. all the way to as recently as 1987. Elizabeth, I have a question. How come you're not getting invited to all these uh, women's live groups <laughs> and women's rights groups? Like the last few years, they've been kind of quiet, you know, with since the uh, Arab Spring of 2011, when uh, women in these countries uh, are forced to ride in the trunk of a car, they can't get driver's licenses, and, and Hillary Clinton and Obama thought, oh, well, we'll bring democracy to these places, but many in the West don't understand the historical background of the tribal warfare between the Shias and the Sunnis that has gone on for over 3,000 years, so we're very lacking in our understanding of historical ancient Near East history, but we're Where's, where's the women's groups asking you to speak up on the behalf of women who are being denied rights uh, because they're in Islamic families? Um, first of all, your guess is as good as mine. Second mm -hmm. of all, maybe I maybe 
one reason is that I'm holding up a mirror and they don't like what they see. And that's why they're not inviting me. Um, yeah, I, like I said in the beginning, I would love to speak to anyone. It doesn't have to be uh, groups on the political right, because I always say, you know, women's rights, uh, universal human rights, the Bill of Rights, uh, they are nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. it, and it concerns, you know, these rights concern everyone, every woman out there. Mm -hmm. uh, how they don't, you know, they should actually be standing in line to, to book me, uh, but they don't. And I'm, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I think it's, it's sad, uh, but I don't think, I think they're not doing it because they're afraid of what I would tell them. Wow. Well. Let's open up for questions. We just have a few minutes. Nancy, you had a question. Go ahead and ask yours. Well, a couple, but um, you, you know, you talked about uh, that you lost the court case. First of all, what does that mean to lose? What happens to you on that regard? Mm -hmm. um, I had to pay a fine, which uh, was 120 day fines, depending on your income. Uh, it was one third of the maximum sentence. And uh, for me, it was 480 euros, which today is approximately the same. Uh, but please don't be fooled. 480 euros uh, is four euro per day, day fine. So if your income is higher, it could go up to 200 or 300 euros a day. And you do the math. 120 times 300 is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So because I, you know, in this case, I'm lucky that I lost my job because it was only 480 euros. Because you didn't have the income, and I didn't therefore have, I didn't. the fine was based on your lack of income. And the court now recognizes that I have no, no income, so you know. Oh, okay. So the the lack. So if they're saying it's it's a they're basing it on offense, then cannot Christians say that they're offended by pedophilia or? By no, you can't. I'm sorry that that is not covered because you're a Christian. Hmm. But we are offended by the the disgusting. You thing. might be that, but the court doesn't recognize that. It's it's only. Islam that is offended and what happened is uh, that the courts in the western world have succumbed to sharia law essentially yeah. that is the problem here and of course we all know that christianity has never been really protected so you can mock uh the cross you can mock jesus you can mock, mock mary uh you can do anything you want with christianity and uh you know it is, isn't it the proverbial cross that we're all carrying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's our duty. Wow. No, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Feel free to unmute. Is everybody shocked by what they heard? Yes. <laughs> it's hard to digest. It is. How is your daughter and your husband through all this? How are they? Um, my husband was and is extremely supportive. Uh, perhaps because he doesn't really have a choice. He, uh, no, he really believes in what I say and he agrees 100%. Uh, it was, I have to admit, it was a very difficult, challenging time for us as a family. Also, my mother was very uncomfortable. Of course, she didn't like seeing her daughter uh, in front of a judge. Um, so it was, it was very rough on her. My daughter thankfully was uh, in primary school at the time. And I was always open with her as much as possible and as, as much as she would understand. And I always said to her, look, uh, when I drove her to school, I said, look, Ella, uh, one of these, your mommy is doing something very important. I cannot tell you all the details right now, but I promise you when you're old enough to understand, I will explain everything to you. She's now 18. Uh, she understands most of it, uh, and and you know this is just something that she's learned to live with. That her mom is is different, and because she's also different, as in she's a highly gifted uh, girl, uh, we get along just fine. Well, the Lord Thank certainly you. created you with a powerful destiny, Elizabeth, because He's had you in these places yes. at very strategic times. Mm -hmm. And he's had his angels or his Holy Spirit both around you to protect you and to guide you yes. and lead you and to give you that boldness of faith and the courage to speak out when many would be quiet and just kind of withdraw into the background. So 
God bless you for Thank you. your Thank faithfulness you. and your and obedience. I, George, it, it means it would mean a lot to me. I know it's 1131 already, but uh, it would mean a lot to you, uh, to me if you could perhaps lead a short prayer for all those persecuted Christians out there, mm -hmm. because there's so many. And I have been very active uh, in marching for persecuted Christians, also in Orlando. Um, and I think we need to keep them in mind. It's not always about the Muslims. It's about those Christians out there who are suffering horribly. Really? And I would be very honored if you could lead a short prayer. Yes, I'm happy to. And before I do that, um, I want to encourage you to, to pray for Elizabeth and her travels, pray for divine appointments, divine introductions, and to consider as you pray to sow into her ministry. You can do that through our website at cmm.world. And we do need to stand up and pray for our persecuted brethren around the world. Um, I serve on the advisory board of SaveThePersecutedChristians.org. You probably know some mm -hmm. of those people. Of course. Um, and I, I invited some of them to be on today, but it was short notice, mm -hmm. so they couldn't make it. But, uh, you know, before um, the pandemic in 2019, there was like 250 or 60 million Christians around the world facing threats and severe persecution. During the last three years, that has increased to over 370 million, a huge percentage increase in just three years time. And we know that there, uh, the Antichrist spirit is rampant, but we know that as the darkness increases across the earth, as the waters cover the sea, that the glory on God's people will continue to shine brighter and brighter. And so we will not back down. We will not compromise. We will not cower before the in intimidation of the bully spirit of all of these Goliaths that are around us. And we'll just be like David of who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would come against the army of the living God. And so, uh, Father God, if, uh, let's gather around, just raise your hands to Elizabeth. Lord, we thank you for her heart, for her passion, for her commitment to battle the enemies of the cross. And Lord, right now we pray for our persecuted brethren. Lord, according to Hebrews uh, 13, 3, remember our brethren in chains around the world. Lord, we pray for Nigeria right now that's dealing with the uh, more election fraud. It seems like they were schooled by uh, U.S. Uh, uh, fraudulent uh, criminals, Lord, on how to, to steal an election. And Father, we just pray for those in, in many countries, in closed nations. Many are, are part of the family of CMM. Some are even students in our CMM College of Theology. And Lord, we, we lift up the masses, the millions that are, are wanting to live godly lives, to provide for their families, to enjoy and to worship you, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for a holy hedge of protection around them, Lord, in any land, even those facing persecution here in America and Canada and the West and those in the eastern part of the world, Lord, in the north and southern hemisphere. We just pray for uh, those that you would call and woo into your spirit. For Father, the uh, harvest is white unto harvest. The fields are white. And Lord, the laborers are few. Lord, send forth the laborers, Father, that we can see this greatest harvest in all of history, even during the time of the largest mass migration in the world's history, as people are hungry to know the Lord, hungry to feel the Father's love. And Lord, send forth the laborers. And Lord, strengthen your people in your ecclesia and your remnant around the world, that the body of Christ would come together as we read in John 17, that we would be one as Jesus and the Father are one. I just bless dear Elizabeth, bless her husband and her daughter and her ministry. Lord, and we pray for all her books to sell out as she writes the next book. Lord, as a freedom fighter, as a pillar of your light and your truth and holiness across the earth. And we just thank you for uh, sending her to us and sending her into the world and preserving her life, Lord, for her purposes and destiny to be fulfilled. Lord, you are always faithful to complete the good work that you started in Elizabeth and each of us, Father. We live for you and we just uh, consecrate our lives to you, Lord, that we be holy as you are holy in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining
those online and we'll share the recording in a day or two as we have it ready. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you, Dr. Nicholas, for joining us once again. My pleasure. Thank you, Nicholas.